I'd like to begin, if I may, by sharing with you the thought that as we become more like the Savior and we internalize the message of the Scriptures, one of the first fruits of that is to discover an ability to recognize the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And as we learn to identify those promptings, there is generally a commensurate ability and courage to respond to them. I'd like to share an experience with you that took place in Burbank about two and a half years ago that teaches this principle. There was a family in one of the Burbank wards that was a part member family. Dad was not a member of the church. He was a large man in stature and very gruff. He smoked a cigar, and because of his gruff nature, the people of the ward put the word out through the bamboo wireless that you're not to bug Brother So-and-so about joining the church. He attended church pretty regularly, more than most. He loved going to fathers and sons' outings. But because of the way he was, people kind of got the word out, don't bug him about joining the church. I've learned an interesting thing about the saints. If you want to keep something a secret from them, put it in a manual. <laughs> They'll never find it. <laughs> but if you want to get something out fast, leak it, and it goes out very quickly. Well, the word got out, don't bug brother so-and-so. As fate would have it, a new family moved into that ward that had not received the word that you're not supposed to bug brother so-and-so about joining the church. A few weeks after this, they were at a father's and son's outing. The son had gone down, the boys were out doing what kids do at father's and son's outings, and the dads were sitting around the fire. Suddenly, this non-member fellow brought from his coat a great long cigar. He usually did this with great flourish because it made everybody a little nervous, and he pulled his cigar out, reached into the embers, and pulled out this coal. Proceeded to light the cigar. The new brother was looking through the fire, saw the cigar, jumped up and said, aren't you a member of the church? And the air went very blue around the rest of the fire. <laughs> And he said, no, can't you see I'm smoking a cigar? Yeah, I can see that, but I want to know why you aren't. I've seen you at church the last several Sundays. Why aren't you a member? Well, at that point, there were several heart attacks around the fire. <laughs> and he said, well, nobody ever asked me that before. And he said, well, I am asking you. You must know it's true. Will you join the church? Well, the bishop about had a cardiac at this point. <laughs> And this good brother stood up and he said, you know, nobody ever asked me that before. And he said, I'm asking you, will you join the church? Well, this good brother put his cigar down. He said, I'll tell you what, friend. He said, I have a quarter in my pocket. And he said, I'll flip that quarter. If it comes up tails, I won't join your church. If it comes up heads, I will. What do you think about that? And this good brother said, well, I haven't got anything to lose. Go ahead and flip your quarter. So this good brother reached in his pocket, pulled a quarter out, flipped it up, and went up through the night sky, as you can imagine. Everybody's sitting around the fire watching this. <laughs> he caught the quarter, put it on his arm. And as the man told the story himself, he said, I looked under my hand, and it was tails. Don't join the church. And he said, as I stood in the firelight that night for the first time in my life, and he had been semi-active in the church for some 20 years, and he said, for the first time in my life, I heard the Spirit speak to me. And it spoke as audibly as if someone were standing next to me. And he said, as I was looking at the quarter, the Spirit whispered in my ear and said, cheat. <laughs> and you know, he said he took that quarter off his arm, put it back in his pocket. He said, well, it's heads. I guess I'll have to join your church. Great, that brother said. They took him down the next day, filled the font, baptized that good brother, and he is now one of the great members of the church in Burbank. Now, brothers and sisters, when we start recognizing the promptings of the Holy Spirit and responding to them, and when we have people with the courage to open their mouths, that's when the miracle happens. You know, the most exciting description of the only true proselyting program I know about in the gospel is in the 33rd section of the Doctrine and Covenants. You've probably read that. Just mark it, if you will. I think this is the only true proselyting program in the church. There are lots of them that come and go. Section 33, verses 8, 9, and 10. It describes this program three times. See if you can pick it out. Open your mouths 
And they shall be filled, and you shall become even as Nephi of old, who journeyed from Jerusalem in the wilderness. Yea, open your mouths, and spare not, and you shall be laden with sheaves upon your backs, for lo, I am with you. Yea, open your mouths, and they shall be filled, saying, Repent, repent, and prepare ye the way of the Lord. What's the only true proselyting program, brothers and sisters? Open your mouths. Invariably, when the saints develop the courage to do that, the miracles occur. And because someone had the faith to do that, this good brother joined the church. Well, brothers and sisters, if we can learn to internalize the message in the scriptures, we will develop the ability to recognize, identify the promptings of the Holy Spirit, which will ultimately save us and promote us into the next sphere with our Father in heaven. I am going to define six words for you, concepts, if you will, that I have pulled from the scriptures. I believe these definitions come from the scriptures. I believe these are the kinds of things that we can and ought to be pulling from the scriptures that will ultimately change our lives. Now, these definitions you will not find in Webster's Dictionary. <laughs> Webster never asked me. <laughs> Probably never will. But I believe the definitions come right from the Scripture. Now, we're going to start with the word wisdom. How would you define wisdom? Common sense in an uncommon degree. Proper use of knowledge. Good. Wisdom is knowledge rightly applied. This goes along very closely with the natural law which said what we do depends upon how we feel about what we know. By the way, the gentleman that shared that thought with me the first time is a man by the name of Lloyd Davis, who's one of our regional representatives, a marvelous man. It's a true statement. What we do depends upon how we feel about what we know. We assimilate knowledge in these kinds of experiences. We go to sacrament meetings, Sunday school, all of the learning experiences that are available to us, and we do nothing more than assimilate knowledge. Our ability to appropriately utilize that knowledge is a measure of our wisdom. Several years ago in New York City, there was a convention held by the American Medical Association, and 2,000 doctors came from all over the country to hear four or five of the bright medical minds of this country present empirical studies on why tobacco is bad for the human body. And during this three-day convention, you could not see across the room. Why? Smoke. They were all smoking. Cigars, cigarettes, pipes, ropes, anything they could get their hands on, they were smoking. And they were there for the express purpose of learning why it was bad for the body. They knew better. Wisdom is knowledge rightly applied. I have a son. His name's Joseph. Can you imagine me naming my son Joseph? I figured if my folks could do it to me, I could do it to him. Well, when he was four years old, we, he was in the kitchen, and I said, you know, Joseph, when the stove's hot, you really had not to touch it. It'll hurt. Knowledge. What do you suppose he did the minute I left? <laughs> he has wisdom now on all four fingers. <laughs> wisdom is knowledge rightly applied. Brothers and sisters, there isn't anybody in this room that doesn't know the difference between right and wrong. There aren't any of our young people that don't know the difference between right and wrong. When we're in the warmth of this atmosphere, it's very easy to identify the differences between right and wrong. But when we get out on that hearth that we talked about last hour and we're all by ourselves, that vision will get fuzzy if we haven't translated the knowledge into wisdom. That's just the way things are. The next word we want to define is sacrifice. What is sacrifice? All right, giving up something precious to you. Giving up something precious for you that's precious to someone else, okay? All right, listen to this definition. This, my wife coined this. I think this is neat. Sacrifice is giving up something good for something better. As I study the great men and women of this church, of this nation, of this earth, 
The common denominator that is in all of them is a willingness, an ability, a capability, if you will, of sacrifice, great sacrifice. Missionaries, for example, sacrifice a great deal. They give up family and home, they give up jobs, they give up schooling, they give up automobiles, they give up girlfriends. They don't think they give up their girlfriends, but they do. <laughs> Four out of a hundred wait. <laughs> That's a useless statistic, but it's interesting. <laughs> For something better, and what is the something better? Serving their Father in heaven and changing, becoming magnificent, powerful young men when they get through, and women. Now, brothers and sisters, the thing that we need to deal with in our lives is this. What am I willing to sacrifice for who I want to become? What am I willing to place on the altar for what I need to accomplish in my life? And that is a very real question that we need to be asking ourselves. Am I willing to give up a little extra sleep in the morning so I can use those magic three hours we talked about? That's good. That extra sleep feels great, doesn't it? Am I willing to sacrifice that? Am I willing to give up mash? Now, we don't want to get carried away with this. <laughs> but we need to ask, what am I willing to sacrifice for what I want to become? One of my fears, brothers and sisters, as I look at our society, is that there just aren't many sacrifices required anymore. Joseph Smith on one occasion said something to effect that an organization that does not have the ability to extract sacrifices of its people doesn't have the ability to save its people. Sacrifice is the common denominator of greatness. Last month we celebrate the Trek West. And as I look at back at the people that, that made that trek and the sacrifices, it's incredible. Well, there are other kinds of sacrifices now. Are we willing to make them? That, I believe, is the issue. All right, the next word that we want to define is success. Success is a willingness to do that which the unsuccessful person is not willing to do. Now, that's so simple, it's almost offensive, <laughs> but it's true. A successful father is willing to do that which the unsuccessful father is not willing to do. A successful mother is willing to do that which the unsuccessful mother is not willing to do. If we have chosen a particular quest, avocation, vocation, family goal, or whatever, we need to draw a profile of what will bring success in that quest. If we are willing to do what that profile demands, then we have a credible claim on success. If we are not willing to do that, then tough. There is no success. When I finished with school at Brigham Young University, I went back to Honolulu, where I had been raised, and I sold life insurance. I was taught to sell life insurance by a Chinese fellow by the name of Roger Tom. Roger Tom makes over $300,000 a year selling life insurance. You can live on that if you work at it, by the way. <laughs> he was incredible. And I decided, you know, if I'm going to succeed at this, I'd better do what Roger does. And so I watched carefully for weeks and months what he did. And when I was willing to do what he did, I had a credible claim on and received success selling life insurance. When I wasn't willing to do what he did, I didn't have the success. For example, he was willing to make 65 telephone calls every day. No one else in our agency was willing to do that. No one else was willing to have to manage $300,000 a year either. <laughs> well, what exactly are you willing to pay? What price will you pay for the success? There are profiles of success all around us. That's the concept of the ego. If you want to be a great father or mother or teacher or whatever role you have identified, Find out what will bring success. Look at that profile. If you want the success, you have to be willing to do that. There is a scripture in the 130th section of the Doctrine and Covenants which says, There is a law irrevocably decreed in heaven before the foundation of this world, upon which all blessings are predicated. And when we receive any blessing from God, 
It is by obedience to that law upon which it is predicated. I think that is the most concise, magnificent description of how the gospel works that I know. What verse is that, by the way? Does anyone have? 20 and 21, 130th section. The Lord simply says, if you want the blessings, live the commandments. If you're not willing to live the commandments, tough. You don't have a claim on the blessings. And it's just that simple. If we want success, we'd better manage ourselves the way successful people manage themselves. We'd better learn to control our time. We'd better build that productivity pyramid. If we're not willing to do any of that, and we just drift back to the soaps or whatever we're doing, then we deserve exactly what we get. All right, the next word we want to define is charity. What is charity? The pure love of Christ. Now, we have to accept that because that's what the scriptures say, right? <laughs> charity is the pure love of Christ. In the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, there is the whole chapter is, is dedicated to charity. And in the first two verses there, we are told that unless we have charity, we are what? Nothing. We have nothing. The 8th chapter of Moroni teaches the same principle. Charity is the pure love of Christ, and without it, we have nothing. In fact, Paul says in Corinthians, if we could have faith, with the power to rearrange these mountains. And if we didn't have charity, that faith would do absolutely no good for us. Without charity, we do not have a claim on the celestial kingdom. I think that means it's pretty important to understand what charity is. Well, we read the scriptures and it says charity is the pure love of Christ. But that is still very conceptual. What does that mean? What is the pure love of Christ? Service, serving others? Loving your brother as yourself, unconditional love. Listen to this definition, and I'm going to put it up on the screen. Charity, which is the pure love of Christ, is the ability to love the sinner and hate the sin. Brothers and sisters, may I make this statement at this point, and I'd like to build on it. When you start to assimilate and really internalize the principle of charity, no one will ever be able to get to you again. You will have a power that no one can get into ever again. Charity, brothers and sisters, means the ability to separate behavior from the human being. And the minute we are able to do that, a magnificent peace comes into our lives. A power comes into our lives. The ability to love the sinner and hate the sin. Here's an example. If we're driving down a busy road, we're on our way to work, and we're going to be a little late, and we're driving as fast as we can, suddenly out from behind us comes a big semi-truck. He doesn't have enough space to pass us, really, and so when it comes, the car, approaching car gets too close, he just moves in to where we are. We have to drive off through the bushes to avoid an accident. We go out and there's a big cloud of smoke and dust and we drive over a little few bushes, finally come to a stop, and that truck goes rolling on down the road. Now, if we had a little red button on our steering wheel that would produce a laser beam that would destroy that truck, <laughs> do you suppose we'd use the button? I think we'd have a lot less traffic in Los Angeles if we all had those buttons. But charity means the ability to love the sinner, the driver of that truck, and hate the sin, the act of driving the truck in front of us. If we have internalized that ability, this time when we wind down the window and wave at him, all five fingers will be exposed, <laughs> and there will be a whole different feeling about that fellow. Why? I noticed who laughed just now, by the way. Why? Because we love the human being regardless of what he has done. Gee, that's a marvelous principle. That is what made the Savior such an incredible human being. No matter what they did to him, he loved them. Do you remember when they brought the adulterous woman to him? I think the Lord had a smile on his face the whole time he did that. 
He was sitting there in the sand, he was drawing, and they came up, big crowd, they were all frustrated, and they had rocks by now. They said, we caught this woman, and the law says she is to be stoned, and we're going to do it. What do you think about that? And he just kind of drew for a while, and they vented their frustrations, and finally he looked up and said, I'll tell you what, brethren, all you that have no sin, you throw the rocks. I think he smiled. What happened? Well, they murmured around for a few minutes, and pretty soon they dropped the rocks, and they all sloughed off. And then he looked up again, and here this gal was by herself. Where are your accusers? Guess they're gone. Yeah. Then what did he say? Go and sin no more. He loved her, brothers and sisters. He didn't like a bit what she had done, but he loved her. That's what charity is. If you're sitting at your dinner table, your boss and his wife is over for dinner, and your four-year-old tips a pitcher of grape juice over and fills your white tablecloth. Do you take that kid out in the kitchen and dismember him while you're chewing him out? You idiot, look what you've done. You've ruined our dinner. Or graciously, firmly take him aside. Johnny, you know, he really did a dumb thing in there. There's a big difference between kids that do dumb things and dumb children. Lord didn't make any dumb children. Ah, oh, they do some very creative things, I'll admit. <laughs> but if we have really internalized this magnificent principle, the way we deal with our children, brothers and sisters, dramatically changes. I had an interesting experience with a woman who came up to me after a seminar we had done in San Fernando <laughs> Valley not long ago. We had been talking about this principle. And she said, you know, she, she said, I have a real problem in my home. She said, I want you to know I really love my husband. And she talked about that. I, I rethought this whole thing, and I really love my husband. But you know, he does something that just destroys me. She said, he puts me down as often as he can because of my weight. She was a little overweight, and she said, especially in front of our friends, he'll make fun of me and call me fig, piggy and fatty and so this sort of thing. And every time he does it, it just destroys me inside. And so I asked her the question. I said, well, does your husband know how you feel? Oh, no, no. I've been taught that, you know, you, you have peace in the home at all costs. Well, I think that is a mistake. And I said to her, you know, I think sometimes the most loving thing you can do is confront a loved one that is causing pain. Nothing anywhere in the scriptures of the gospel of Jesus Christ says that we have to be a floor mat for anyone. And I said to this woman, I said, suppose you were in the spirit of charity, go to your husband and attack his behavior. Now, there's a big difference, brothers and sisters, between attacking the human being, which is this, and confronting where you're destroying each other, to standing together side by side like this, and attacking the behavior. And I said, suppose you were to do this. Suppose you were to go home to your husband and say something like this. Sweetheart, I've got a real problem, and I need to discuss it with you. It's something that means a lot to me. And very seriously and, and sweetly but firmly, and say, you need to understand that every time you put me down because of my weight, it just destroys me inside. Now, I can't change whether or not you're going to stop doing that or not, but I just need you to understand that when you do it, it destroys me inside, and I don't like it. And then I said, suppose after you said that, you were to say something like, now, sweetheart, do you want our relationship to get better or worse? And see how he responds. Now, anybody who is rational and the spirit is right and the behavior is being attacked and not the individual will respond appropriately. And you know, he did. And he said, gee, I didn't know it was causing that much pain. It hurts a lot. She was very serious. And it changed their whole relationship. And he stopped. And suddenly she started being able to lose weight because she was loving enough to confront. And she wasn't attacking him. She was attacking behavior. And when we can do that, brothers and sisters, in the spirit of love, and that's what the Savior was able to do, then real changes start to take place. And a power comes to us. And when we can separate the individual from the behavior, no one can anymore get inside and hurt and intimidate and put down. It's just not possible because we have plugged into a power that is so much greater than that that they just can no longer cause pain. When the Savior went through the Gethsemane experience, 
He bled from every pore. And I've often wondered why. Why the Savior wasn't being beat upon. There he was alone by himself. I believe the reason he bled from every pore was because at that point, God the Father had to withdraw himself from the Savior. He had been close to the Savior for 33 years. Now he had to leave him alone. Son, you've got to do this by yourself. That was the deal in the council, remember? And the Savior said things like, Boy, Father, if there's any way else to do this, let's do it that way. But if this is the only way, all right, I made the deal, we'll do it. The Father said that's the only way. And then he withdrew himself. And I think their spirits were so intermingled that it pulled the blood from his veins. And after all of the mental and the spiritual and the emotional pain of the Gethsemane experience. In about 18 to 20 hours, they added the physical pain, a kind of pain that we can't even begin to comprehend, excruciating physical pain. And from that position, he still was able to forgive and say, Father, forgive these people. They have no idea who I am. They don't know what they're doing. Don't be too hard on these people, Father. He still loved them. Is it too much to ask then for us to internalize that with our interpersonal relationships and learn to separate behavior from the human being and love the human being? Brothers and sisters, that's the most frustrating thing you'll ever do to somebody that is trying to get to you, is love them. That's a marvelous principle, just a marvelous principle, and tremendous power comes from understanding and internalizing that simple, simple definition. All right, the next word we want to define is the definition of character. Character. That's sort of like the definition of time, isn't it? Everybody knows what character is, but let's put some words to it. What is character? A set of rules you run your life by, okay? Consistency with yourself, good. Self-discipline, good. The result of your actions, good. Listen to this definition. Boy, I just love this definition. This will work on you after you've committed to memory. It'll start to bug you a lot. Character is the ability to carry out a decision after the emotion of making that decision has passed. Don't you just love that? Character is the ability to carry out a decision after the emotion of making that decision has passed. Now you let your mind work on that for a while and it'll start to have some very interesting impact. May I share an interesting story with you? Several years ago when I was in Portland, Oregon, I was vice president of a large computer firm, and I had a very nice office in one of these glass palaces in downtown Portland. At 9.30 every morning, I had a ritual that I went through. I would go up, I would get out of my chair, go out of my office, walk down two hallways into a phenomenal lunchroom. Now, there are lunchrooms and there are lunchrooms. This was a phenomenal lunchroom. In that lunchroom, there was a magnificent candy bar machine. This was not just your average candy bar machine. It was a magnificent one. It was my shrine to which I paid homage every day. <laughs> and I would sink a quarter into that machine and retrieve a Heath candy bar. You ever had a Heath candy bar? Boy, they are neat. I'd take it with a needle if I could. <laughs> Well, on one occasion, I was standing there with about to go through my daily ritual, and I had my quarter in my hand, and there were two fellows sitting across the lunchroom, obviously thinking that I could not hear. One said to the other, Hiram is getting porky, isn't he? <laughs> I froze in midair with my quarter and I put it back in my pocket and I looked over to see who it was and I could have fired both of them. <laughs> and I went back to my office. I didn't walk back to my office. I stormed back to my office. I was just furious. And I walked into my office, slammed the door. My secretary, I'm sure, thought the world was coming to an end. And I slumped down in my chair just furious. 
I was 25 pounds overweight. I weighed 225 pounds, which is about 25 pounds too many for me. My wife, who is with us tonight, happens to be a marvelous athlete. She held the broad jump record at BYU for nine years, played on their traveling basketball and softball team, and is one fine athlete. Keeps herself in incredible condition. Drives me nuts. <laughs> she had been on me for two years to lose this 25 pounds. You know, I tried, and I, but I just love Heath candy bars. It's just this thing. After a few minutes, I picked up the phone and I called her and I said, sweetheart, you'll be happy to know I am going to lose those 25 pounds. You've been bugging me for two years. This time I'm going to do it. You understand what I'm saying? I'm really serious. Well, she's excited. Boy, Harm, that's great. I've got this Weight Watchers diet. I'll put you on it right away. She was just ecstatic. We used to play two-on-two -two with our missionaries, by the way, and precious few of them could beat us. We were tough. Well, how long do you suppose that lasted? Eight hours. What happens at the end of eight hours when you make a resolve like that? You get hungry. That's what happens. <laughs> and you go home and you walk by the refrigerator and it reaches out and grabs you and you find yourself sitting on the third shelf eating everything you can get your hands on. <laughs> Character, brothers and sisters, is the ability to carry out a decision after the emotion of making that decision has passed. Now, I would hope that during some time in this week, you develop some emotional desires to make some changes in perhaps your goal setting. Character is a measure of whether or not you'll ever do it. Simply stated, character is doing what you say you're going to do. The Savior was a man of character. He did everything he said he was going to do, bar none. He did it all. Brothers and sisters, if we're not going to do something, don't say you are. One of the things that fascinates me about our management of the church is we tend to allow, and not only allow, but encourage mediocrity in the management of the church at our level. Why? Well, because it's the church, and if I don't do my job, what are they going to do, fire me for crying out loud? <laughs> if I don't get my home teaching done, no big thing, I'll do it next month. Suppose, brothers and sisters, that we all represented the Escondido steak, and I am in charge of this steak, but we're not a steak, we're the Exxon Company. And Ella MacArthur comes in here, and he is top management from that company, and he says, you know, Mr. Smith, how are you doing here? And I say, well, we're doing 75%. You know what he'd say? He'd say, you know, not counting tomorrow, Mr. Smith, how long did you work for this company? <laughs> I wouldn't be here anymore. We wouldn't tolerate that. But we tolerate it here because we are not economically tied to our performance here. Do you suppose, let's suppose you all make $30,000 a year, and you will be paid this year the same percentage against that $30,000 that you got in home teaching or visiting teaching. Would that make any difference? Yeah, I would. <laughs> we did 110%. We'd visit those people to death. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we represent middle management of the most important entity in the universe, the kingdom of God on earth. This should be managed better than any corporate entity, Exxon, IBM, any of them. There is no excuse for mediocrity in management of this church, the kingdom of God on earth. And whether you're a regional representative or a state president or a Sunday school teacher, an explorer, advisor, we represent middle management of that entity. And we have an obligation to manage it with character. We have an obligation to manage ourselves with character. That's what the gospel is all about. If you get the message of the scriptures, is to build character so that we are out there doing what we commit to do. Wouldn't it be marvelous if everybody in the stakes of Zion did exactly what they told the bishop they were going to do? We'd have Enoch. Well, that's what character is all about. Next word I want to define is humility. <clears throat> now, I've had an interesting experience with humility. <laughs> when I was called on my first mission, I was living in New York City. I was going to school there. And when the word got to my associates that I was going on a mission, about 18 of them, one-on-one, -on -one, not together as a group, but one-on-one, -on -one, took it upon themselves to come up to me and say, Hiram, 
you're going to have to get humble now you're going on a mission. <laughs> Enough of them said it that I discovered I must not have any of this humble thing because they all said I had to get it now. And so I started asking around, what is it? I really wanted to know because everything I read said you've got to have that first before you can have all these other blessings. And I got the typical answers. You know, you're not proud and boisterous and lifted up and all of that. And I guess I was all of those. But I never got an answer that I could really dwell on because I read an article by Spencer W. Kimball, who was then an apostle, and he said, you can't recognize your own humility. The minute you recognize your own humility, you've lost it. And I don't know about you, but there ain't anybody more humble than me. <laughs> I mean, I really am. Well, you can't recognize your own. And so I said, if that's true, then humility must be the byproduct of some other effort. When I got into the mission field on one occasion, I was teaching a young man. He was an English policeman, a Bobby. You've seen these Bobbies, 6'4", great guy. He just lost his wife through a tragic illness, and he had some young children. He exhibited to me all of the characteristics of humility. We were studying that evening out of the 32nd chapter of Alma. May I recommend the first 16 verses of that deals with humility in a beautiful way. It describes two kinds of humility. See if you can pick them out and the kind you want to have. While we were discussing this chapter, I looked at Brother Hill and I said, Brother Hill, would you mind telling me what humility is to you? And he looked at the ceiling for a minute and he said, Well, Elder Smith, isn't humility the realization of our dependence on God. Boy, when I heard that, brothers and sisters, that was the answer. That was my definition that I'd been looking for. Humility is the realization of our dependence on God. We can go after that. And when we have really internalized, accepted the fact that God is in charge and that everything we have been, are, or ever will be is a direct blessing and gift from God. Humility sneaks in the back door. We'll never recognize it ourselves because we're too busy being grateful for all the things that God has done for us. Others may recognize it. We never will. Humility, brothers and sisters, is a byproduct of that recognition. One of the most difficult tasks that we have as men and women of today is to admit that God is in charge. And when we do, humility comes. I had a really interesting experience when I was in the mission field. We had just finished the state conference. In fact, I was with Elder Davis. We had both spoken. We were standing up on the stand, and one of the members of the high council of this state came up to me, and he said, how can anybody be so humble and arrogant at the same time? And I said, uh, gee, I am not sure. And then he just turned around and walked away. And I turned to Elder Davis and I said, Elder Davis, do I come across arrogant? And he said, yeah, sometimes. <laughs> I don't know why I told you that, but it's really interesting. <laughs> Humility is recognizing our dependence on God. Brothers and sisters, we can go after that. And if we make that our quest, then all the benefits of humility will come. Have we given you a definition of rationalization? Let me just give this to you, and I want to share one last quick thing before we run out of time. Rationalization is legitimizing impropriety. Don't ask me to spell it. As my mother would say, who was a great English teacher, sound it out. <laughs> Rationalization is legitimizing impropriety you know I'll tell you a marvelous experience I had with my mother mothers can get away with anything she was at a seminar I was doing in Salt Lake City about four months ago and my mother you need to understand is an English teacher my father was a professor of speech my mother knows English very well she was sitting on about the fourth row <laughs> and I made a grammatical error and she corrected me from the fourth row <laughs> It was really neat. She, she, you know, she just forgot where she was. And she said, no, that's not how you say that. It's me, not I. 
Thank you, Mother. <laughs> they just hooted. That was really neat. Well, she just about died. Then she realized where she was. <laughs> Moms can do anything. Isn't that right? Moms, they can do anything. All right, let me close with this thought. Brothers and sisters, these are just some, just some of the messages that come from the scriptures. And when we start feasting on them on a regular basis, we start to assimilate these messages. The messages change our lives. They cannot change our lives until we identify, accept, and internalize the messages. Lives change as a result of feasting on the words of Christ. I know that God lives. I know that Jesus Christ is his son and that this is his kingdom on the earth today. And with that goes, I believe, an awesome responsibility to perform well. I bear that witness in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.